That, yeah, oh, that's it. Glory to Jesus Christ. The ages of ages. Amen. Amen. It's the last of the three bridegroom services that we serve. It's important for us to understand why these three services are called the bridegroom service. Christ is the bridegroom of the church. But the church did not begin with the incarnation of God. The church began with the creation of the world. As the Holy Fathers tell us, especially Basil Gregory and John Chrysostom, that the church existed from the beginning, but had fallen into barrenness, like those barren women of old, who only through a special miracle of God could bring forth life in fulfillment of promises and prophecy. Christ came to rescue the church from her barrenness, to make her once more life-bearing, life-giving. When we say, Behold, the bridegroom comes at midnight, and blessed is the one who shall be found wakeful or watching, we first of all think of the parable of the ten wise and the ten foolish virgins. For it says that these ten virgins, five wise and five foolish, had gone out to meet the bridegroom. And while they tarried, the wise virgins had brought extra oil for their lamps that they might trim the wicks and fill the lamps when they heard that the bridegroom was arriving. But the foolish virgins did not bring extra oil. They had no oil for their lamps. And while they went to buy oil to fetch it from some place, behold, the bridegroom arrived at midnight. And the wise virgins, with joy, entered into the banquet hall together with the bridegroom. But when the foolish virgins finally arrived back at the door, they were turned away. Depart from me, I never knew you. When we look at the icon of the bridegroom, we always see Christ wearing the crown of thorns. Because the crown of thorns is the wedding crown of the heavenly bridegroom. Our Lord Jesus Christ was wed and crowned to his earthly bride, the church, in pain and suffering and sorrow with a crown of thorns. We understand then the great love that God had for mankind to raise up his church, to fill her with life. You remember how our Lord spoke another parable, that he planted a vineyard, and in the fullness of time when the crop was ready, he sent many of his servants to get the fruit from the vineyard. And they cast them out and killed them. And finally, thinking they would hearken to his own son, he sent the son also. But when they realized that it was the son of the master of the vineyard, they killed him also. In this parable, our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the holy prophets who were sent aforetime to proclaim and try to make people understand that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament between God and Israel was not actually a legal agreement but was supposed to be manifested in a spousal relationship. And this is why all the holy prophets speak about the relationship between God and Israel in the terms of a spousal relationship where God is the faithful spouse and Israel is continuously becoming the unfaithful spouse. But people wouldn't hearken. They still relied on the law which they themselves could not actually fulfill. When our Lord Jesus Christ came, and as Paul says, tore up the manuscript of the law which was against us, for he came to espouse himself directly to his earthly bride, the church. 
since all the prophets who came were not heeded. In the fullness of time, the very Son himself came, was incarnated in the flesh so he could be seen and heard, united God and man together in himself, or rather we should say reunited God and man together in himself. And Apostle Paul says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her and refers to the church as the pure spotless bride of Christ. So truly Christ is the bridegroom who has entered into our life, who has entered into our world physically, visibly, as the heavenly bridegroom to rescue his church from her fallenness, to lift her up from her barrenness and fill her with grace that she might bear fruit of salvation once more that she might bear the fruit of those, as Paul says, those mysteries which were hidden before the ages, which are now proclaimed to us through the church. But when we speak of a bridegroom and a bride, we speak of a great unselfish love. For a spousal relationship involves an unselfish love between husband and wife, and an unselfish love between the children <coughs> and the parents, an unselfish love for Christ, an unselfish love for the church, as Christ has bestowed the greatest possible unselfish love upon us. And tonight we read in the Gospel how our Savior preparing his disciples for the advent of his crucifixion. To understand that the crucifixion is such an outpouring of love because Christ says if my arms are spread out on the cross I will draw all people to myself. I will embrace all mankind and those who will accept my embrace will receive everlasting life. So when we reverence and venerate the icon this evening look for a while upon the crown of thorns on the head of Christ. And see with what love, with what compassion, and through what pain and what suffering and what sorrow he has demonstrated the total, complete, unselfish love of God for mankind. And see that he's crowned with a crown of thorns upon his head. And remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ prayed so fervently that he sweat blood, and said, Father, remove this chalice from me if it is possible. And we understand from the Holy Fathers that the chalice which gave him such a terrible burden was not a fear of death, for he knew that he was the master of life. But that his heart was tormented for the sake of the condition of mankind. And that fervent prayer and that heavy chalice heavy to be borne from one so filled with love and compassion. The sins of mankind that he took upon himself and dissolved them with the power of his love and nailed our sins to the cross and broke down the middle wall which was between us and God and in himself clearly reunited us, the two together so seeing Christ as the bridegroom of the church, crowned with such indescribable love through such suffering and pain, leads us to understand why on Great and Holy Wednesday we also serve the healing service. Because as Christ came to heal the fallenness of his church, to heal her barrenness and fill her with grace that she might become life-giving, He also came to heal the fallenness of mankind, to heal the fallen human nature. For all, almost all of his miracles were healing miracles. You remember how we, on the Sunday yet to come of the pool of Bethesda, when in one hymn our Lord Jesus Christ approaches the man who's crippled, sitting near the pool but not close enough to get into it. And he says to him, Son, do you wish to be healed? 
The man says, Yea, Lord, I wish to be healed, but I have no man to put me into the water. And Jesus Christ replies and says, How can you say that you have no man? Behold, the Son of God has become your man. Rise up and walk. The Son of God has become our man. The Son of the living God has become the one who has come to us to lift up our crippled heart, to lift up our crippled souls, to stand upon our feet once more, to be healed by the power of his love, that we might truly come to Holy Pascha filled with joy and understand the glory of that day. Behold, the bridegroom cometh in the middle of the night, and blessed is the servant whom he shall find watching. Let us make sure, brothers and sisters, that we're found among the five wise, and not outcast with the five foolish, but that we watch, because our Lord Jesus Christ could come for each one of us any day. We're not talking about the last days, the end of time, the end of the world, because this life could end for any one of us at any moment, at any hour. And we should be found at that time with our hearts toward, turned toward our Lord Jesus Christ, remembering the crown of thorns with which he wed himself to the church, so that the church herself could be a light-bearing spring but above all, so that we should understand the power of the crucifixion, not as a power of death or defeat, not as if it were paying God back for some offense we wrought against him, but because upon the cross we saw the King of glory glorified by the Father, as he says in the reading, I have glorified you and will glorify you again. It's time for the Son of Man to be glorified, that is lifted upon the cross, to see that the glory of God and the shocking truth about God is that God is meek and humble and lowly of heart and filled only with love and compassion toward his poor crippled and fallen creatures toward us. Let us therefore glorify the bridegroom and watch and keep watch for he cometh in the middle of the night to keep the candles burning in our hearts and the lamps burning in our soul, watching for the bridegroom of the church to come for us.